Hello everyone, today we talk about Cartaginian tactics from the late 4th century BC to the end of uh, this independent Carthaginian history. Um, we uh, have already made a video about the Carthaginian army organization during the same period. We have actually looked at a battle or two also from previous times, like the Battle of Ymerad and the Battle of Tunis, but we've never made practically uh, a any battle yet about the Punic Wars with the only exception of Ilipa that is not just the full display of Carthaginian tactical capabilities rather um, a, a Roman one uh, so you understand it it's a very uh, it's a very difficult topic to approach just in a comprehensive video because Carthaginian tactics um, developed first of all over these centuries as we will partly observe now but they are uh, let's say significantly influenced over time also by Hellenistic warfare in a sense of really strategic school not much in the uh, and philosophical thought because it, that's really what we're got down to and this um, development, as you know, would uh, peak with Hannibal, right? We somehow should understand really what Hannibal did from a tactical point of view, which was really creating a new type of battle that had properly the objective of luring the enemy in a in a not just in a in a trap, but in in one that would that had been planned. Right, it had to work with all the elements on the battlefield, acting synergically to obtain a specific purpose that is also properly a political one. So, uh, it's uh, uh, it's been argued that after the Battle of Cannae, nothing has really been added anymore to the to to tactics. Right, and there is um. A truth in that we will see this perhaps better in other videos including the one in fact about I don't know the Battle of Cannae that we haven't made yet and that probably re requires in fact more than one video so I always say this during the introductions and I probably sound boring but I really care very much about these topics because they're not merely uh, the kind of the exotic okay let's pick now whichever you know, um, polity here as a sort of video game faction and see what these guys were about. There is a broader context that all these peoples were fundamentally getting through and um, interacting with in, in, in different ways according to, you know, dependently on each other and naturally the, the basis of their power uh, and the challenges they had to face. So in the case of Carthage and in her struggle against Rome there is definitely a lot to learn like if you want to properly study the most uh, complete war of all times it's the second Punic War right there is literally everything there to also to a level of in fact a tactical and strategic finesse that you basically do not see in the rest uh, of military history that's a real school and we haven't even began to uh, teach the, the first lesson, right? So I, I plan to do this because um, uh, it, it, it unavoidably deserves on, on a channel like this. You know that for ancient history, ancient warfare, we, we go uh, at a bit of a slower pace than medieval one for obvious reasons, but um, uh, this is in fact something that helps also making every step a bit more thoughtful, uh, I would say. So uh, today we will not also digress in Carthaginian politics to core or society, of course there is much of that behind it, you know that Carthage was fundamentally a great it, it's called a republic in a sense meaning an oligarchy really uh, that uh, let's say of, of families involved in war and trade right? in a somehow typical fashion almost a feudal one except it had uh, coalesced in the, you know, from a from a, from a Phoenician urban context and that had remained fundamentally uh, within the, the, the boundaries of because Carthage was a city really and even her own colonies were just uh, an appendix of this not much like the demographic colonies of the Greeks and the Romans more like trade centers um, and the enormous wealth of Carthage could 
essentially provide her with um, an endless supply of mercenaries that in this period were really quite numerous from uh, various areas of, of the Western Mediterranean um, from you know Carthaginian uh, perspective uh, and that could allow in fact uh, like ambitious clans such as the, the Barset one in fact to experience at least in certain contexts such as in fact that the Barset conquest of uh, of Spain of at least of the southern Iberian Peninsula and so the creation of very large private assets uh, say an, an advancement uh, in the art of war to in fact this this enormous pool of resources that were de facto even um, hint, uh, say an inch from the one of, 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 of the motherland was quite suspicious of the activity of, of these um, of these noblemen uh, and that um, essentially tried the arrangement uh, in parallel of the uh, Romano-Italic confederacy essentially separating the Romans from their uh, from from their allies uh, in Italy an endeavor that failed Right, but that was spectacularly, um, um, you know, performed, um, attempted at least, in, um, you know, with, with the peak, right, of tactical, tactical and strategical finesse, mostly tactical, right? Hannibal didn't get everything right, strategically speaking, mostly it's Scipio that really carried out a perfect campaign, right, in, in Spain and in Africa. Uh, and that, in fact, um, would bring the same Rome, or pair fully with the uh, probably the, the the highest refinement of Hellenistic warfare, because here Carthage fundamentally surpassed, at least probably with Hannibal's um, command, the same Macedonian way of war, right? And the Romans would adopt this with essentially performing tactics that up to that point had not been properly contemplated in the Roman military, namely the capacity of willing about like entire chunks of, of the army, of the, of the manipular legions, um, to fall on the enemy flank, something again that the Romans up to the Second Punic War could could not experience essentially because they hadn't fully ingrained like in, uh, a professional gear that now a Pluri um, decade uh, long um, uh, experience overseas, by the way, and not just you know to the, to the neighboring Sicily, but literally up to Spain, Africa, and so on, um, obliged them to right and d displaying there probably the the full potential of Rome. Right, we often read things like I don't know the Carthaginians were more technologically advanced of, uh, than the Romans at this, but it's not really true. Right, Rome had already Basically, think about how the Romans literally, you know, created a fleet out of scratch and defeated the Carthaginians at what were best, right, in that sense, a maritime force already in the First Punic War. Today, we do not talk about um, maritime tactics that are um, secondary, but we will make videos about that at some point as well. Uh, we often think that, I don't know, the Romans had a weak cavalry, which was not true. Actually, Rome had a better cavalry than the Carthaginian one. They always won in condition of numerical parity. And and the Romans had even better cavalry commanders than the uh, the Carthaginians. Think about Lelius, right? We remember great names like the one of the Africanus, but even uh, Nero, for example, the Battle of the Metaurus River is... You know, just showing you how extensive already the just the Roman potential, but properly the already the ideas that were that the Romans had been toying with that now they could put into practice by a degree, especially after the, the shock of Cannae really could be right. The Romans were already let's say Hellenistic in the military guys. Think about the art of encampment that allegedly they would learn they had learned from Pyrrhus, but they likely already have been developing on their own. Uh, we just made recently uh, a video about um, the uh, Gastrofetus and the and early artillery. We've seen that actually the, the very early uh, uh, artillery in use uh, was somewhere by, by Italic hand, right, by Greek uh, inventors, but still, you know, in, in a context that was essentially uh, next door to Rome in the 4th century BC. So there would be really a lot to tell 
about you know I mean you know how this, the the Punic Wars ended <laughs> in the first place so I don't need to add more strategically speaking the only point being being able to frame specifically what Carthage really was too because by saying that this was essentially an Hellenistic power in strategic culture doesn't mean at all that the Carthaginians were for example a just a byproduct of say uh, the, the, the Macedonian culture right Hellenism had again been had, had been mostly a matter of intellectual superiority applied in this case to a very specific African context um, and that um, which by the way could have been enactable just by uh, by, by, by Carthage at that point aside from you know you can consider it Ptolemaic Egypt but again it's that it's fully Macedonian in nature and really Carthage had too an extra gear because of the particular as we've seen political institutional system that there was um, and we'll see now better how what this means first of all um, I get I think I'm stern but fair right that there is nowadays who is at least within the the, uh, the stereographical noises knows this perfectly but there are lots of people out there that still stop to Connolly's mis mistranslation of the term longke right from the Lerp translator which basically turned in his opinion the Carthaginian uh, infantry into uh, you know Sarusophoroi right into, into essentially an, uh, a Macedonian uh, phalanx of pikemen and the worst being that not just that you, you'd expect you know uh, at least what in, in these in fact quite poor environments it, sh it should be con should be considered um, you know a renowned historian but also everybody literally following him blindly without understanding much nor about it's not much about the, the, the knowledge of ancient Greek it, it's really about uh, how you study history in the first place and if you have any serious background then kind of literally strategical education because at this point yes it's also about having a poor classical education not having grown to that sensitivity uh, sensitivity to, to properly to the classical text what properly the prelinean vocabulary uh, is about but you, you often see this concept that uh, stems in part also from from the fact from the obvious fact that the uh, Greek texts call basically any other kind of heavy infantry they knew abroad a phalanx that is a steamroll right and that essentially um, could could be uh, really identified as such just in the Roman infantry the Celtic infantry the, the Libo Phoenician infantry that sometimes is also called oplitic right and people that look at a guy um, uh, you know dressed up like in a in quite uh, uh, Hellenistic fashion uh, even with a with an aspis with anything that again an Hellenistic helmet whatever uh, has to say oh my god that's an hoplite so they vote like hoplite like Greeks right um, no right hoplitism and I still haven't made a video specifically about that but we will have to, to discuss it because it's also one of the single most discussed topics ever is indeed not really the rigid notion that we have that mostly developed after the Viet say Vietnam War historiography that was a bit obsessed with this uh, fear of hand hand -to combat and transforming into something pretty weird that today has been really normalized but objectively is something quite unique actually hoplitism was something quite exceptional even within properly the Hellenic world in in the theoretical sense that we have at least uh, built up of it um, but definitely uh, it, it was um, a different type of combat from anyone right it's just like the the Hellenistic pikeman phalanx it didn't spread beyond a certain uh, a certain boundary right uh, there were there is a source that says that at the Battle of Zama the Macedonians had sent uh, their own their own infantry at some point and people think oh my god at Zaman the word Macedonian pikemen well uh, not really right considering especially the uh, the poor f uh, financial state in which the Antagonists were at that point it's highly unlikely and that source is not really uh, particularly reliable but aside from this no there, there was nothing uh, oplitic and um, phalangitic in the Hellenic sense 
in the Carthaginian armies. We have properly to get rid of this modernistic categorism that wants us to just to find, you know, e equations, right? Just like the entire concept of equality, which is probably the greatest disease in the history of mankind, and instead concentrating on the differences and the peculiarities, not just of every culture, but literally of every army. There has never been in the history of mankind nor an army, nor a soldier that have been always ever been the same, right? Not even in the times of greater standardization. Um, and this is relevant because the military instrument, as we know, is not just like, again, we, we have, say, our generation of late millennials has um, grown old with video games, like, I don't know, think about the Total War series and so on. So there is often this, this idea that you know, just uh, people had this specific set of options, like a roster, right? And especially if this was substantially different, also in the strategic essence, from the one of other people. But we, if we get really you know, used to, to what this warfare really was, just things varied. But there was also substantial um, similarity, which indeed, in the way as we are saying, that the Greeks could call, in fact, um, Carthaginian heavy infantry phalanx, we, we can't un understand, right, in the core concept, right? So, and this actually helps, especially in the Carthaginian case, to understand really what Hannibal, especially, was able to carry out with the sum of elements that, again, were pretty much present pretty much everywhere, but that um, had some relative variations regionally, culturally, to the point you could pick a bit the best from every area, but especially training them to carry out certain uh, tactics, certain maneuvers, certain operations that had never quite been seen with that lucid vision of properly military instrument for, for a political aim, right? Um, by the way, all right, well, we'll see him later because I was about to quote Xantippus and people that think that the Spartans told uh, how to fight the Carthaginians. It's absolutely BS, right? The, the battle of uh, at Bagratus has absolutely nothing to do with the Spartiata. At least, you know, there's no proof of that. Um, and it, it's something quite different. So let's not degenerate in Spartanophilia, which, again, as much as I like Sparta myself and we are... Uh, actually making multiple videos about that recently really has no place here really and you have to understand again the merits not as a sort of paste and copy of some tools but again what could be done politically and socially at, at a given point in a given time um, so again Carthaginian armies as we have already seen as it's generally known were based on fundamentally heavy infantry right infantry was the queen of battles this point, even though the Carthaginians could feel something quite picturesque, like uh, elephants, chariots, as we'll see now, at the end of the day, they were, of course, heavy infantry-based, uh, and it couldn't be really different from a sedentary civilization from the Mediterranean. Um, the equipment of the uh, Carthaginian citizenry um, as much as the one of the Libophoenician infantry, we will, will distinguish part of the thing now, did not correspond, as we were saying before, exactly to opolitic weaponry, right? When you see, uh, I made a video, for example, about the Etruscan hoplite, uh, right? You know, you see, especially the aristocracies, and in the case, especially of the Carthaginian infantry, that there was plenty of that, right? You, you see, of course, these men buying their panoplies from what were at the time essentially the most advanced uh, arms and armor producer at the time it was the were the Greeks right so there was something much even just about the style etc that however should be seen really in the essentials right uh, even we've seen it straight sword versus curved sword is it a huge deal not so much right a helmet is still a helmet the shield is just a shield that's not what is going to make uh, structurally the difference uh, especially if this is not properly functional to a, a type of warfare that can even you know uh, enhance the you know the exalt let's say the um, the technological 
function itself. Um, so um, is there a difference in here? Yes, because essentially Carthage ruled, as we've seen, as a city, so with a, with a political body uh, constituted by the freemen that were mostly belonging to, to the great uh, clients, at least they or were fundamentally the, the clients of these great uh, oligarchs that own extensive latifundia outside of Carthage, from which, by the way, very fine horse breeds and also a substantial amount came from. We will look at Carthaginian cavalry briefly later, and naturally we have to make a video for each kind of unit type as as, as I used to do, so everything will, will be seen step by step, um, hopefully. Um, and when you look at the, uh, in fact, citizen army, right, that included chariots, cavalrymen, uh, infantry, naturally of different types, in a complete way, you're looking at a substantially uh, rich, well-armored, well, uh, well-armed, in fact, um, force, right, with also a sense of political identity as some kind of, of course, shared values, etc., that, however, would not take the field so often, especially in later times, so they preferred to delegate that to the um, to the mercenaries, because they had gentrified, just, just, they were very rich, but properly the, the heroic age now had passed for for many uh, peoples at this point. Um, and these would look the most, like especially the sacred um, band, etc., uh, as, at least on the surface, like like an oplitic arm. Right? If, if anything, for the equipment. Heavy infantrymen, large shields, armor, you know, uh, 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 close, you know, uh, uh, close uh, cohesion, uh, spe- spears, etc. There was probably also there a, a tactical segmentation that we can't reconstruct precisely because uh, it's not much about the Romans literally raising to the ground Carthage in the Third Punic War. It's literally the the general scarcity of you know the, the general difference really in documentation between say peoples like the Greeks, the Romans, etc. And already the Romans were pretty primitive and rough, especially until the Punic War. Um, but um, that, um, in fact, we know mostly from the Atlantic sources rather than the, the local ones. There are some stelae from Carthage dating from, of course, before the the Roman the Roman conquest and all this stuff that give us some info. But essentially, we do not know too much, right? We have most on, for example, the appearance of the sacred band when we, until when it was used. We have to rely on Atlantic. Uh, historiography, say, when these units appeared in a given battle, and that's pretty much it. Carthage, as such, as this this Phoenician city, ruled over um, a substantial area in, in the western Mediterranean, especially based in North Africa, and in the area of, in fact, would be called um, Africa, roughly today's Tunisia, and the uh, Libyan coastline, parts also of the Algerian up to the, the Gibraltar Strait in Morocco, etc. But mostly based in this Libyan area. And because of the, the Phoenician colonization, naturally had taken control of some coastal centers, um, there was, um, uh, you know, mixed um, unions, etc., colonization, uh, cult- various uh, cultural s- superimpositions. Thus, we talk about a uh, an element of the Carthaginian army that made up likely the, n- the numerical bulk of the Carthaginian heavy infantry, and thus, at large, the Carthaginian army composed of the so-called by the so-called Libophoenicians. These troops had likely again we, we don't know them too much, but they mostly came from a. a Military wise, culturally, broadly meant from a uh, traditional Libyan background, right? Uh, the Libyans, especially in the Bronze Age, were one of the single most successful peoples uh, in arms that managed to carve their own their own space um, in in the world. Uh, and by this point, they had kind of lost it anyhow, yet maintaining part of their, in fact traditional fighting style that consisted mostly of a heavy javelin called Lonke, 
plural lonchi, which is a Greek term that we know, in fact, just through the through the Greek sources, because I don't think we know, I mean, we don't know how it was called in Punic, that remains somehow mysterious language, of course, um, and that was fundamentally similar to the average kind of um, warrior of the sedentary world, so again, a guy with this uh, couple of spears slash javelins that you can't quite even distinguish too much, sometimes, but not always even a sword and or at least um, a dagger of some sort, a shield. And normally, you know, if they were like a helmet, much uh, less often uh, heavy armor. Um, that, however, of course, the local liberal Phoenician elites definitely had. Right. In any case, you have still a heavy infantry that is similar again to whatever you can find uh, around. Think about the so-called. Uh, to Realforoi that uh, I also made a video on and that uh, often get a bit equivocated, like what were they were more like or heavy, they were definitely heavy infantry in, in the concept that they were, but they could naturally adapt to, to other roles um, so the, the liberal Phoenicians were again more um, uh, more traditional, not just in the world fighting, but in their traditional weapons. So much so that when you look at the Second Punic War and the massacre of Roman legionnaires that happened there, you have um, sources stating that uh, at least the first ranks of the Libo Phoenician infantry looked very similar to the uh, Romano Italic warriors because of the arms. They had the, the scoot, etc. But it's likely that entirely they would remain fundamentally just, they would stick just to their own long K and their traditional shields, because the Scutum takes an important deal of training and way of fighting, and uh, the Pila as well, that are not quite just as the long K, in spite of the fact that they're still heavy javelins. Uh, and so again, don't think that there were, from one side, essential differences, what these troops could do on the field, but not that they were literally the same thing, or that they would have to just adapt, like, I don't know, fighting in Hannibal's army in Italy, just fighting as Roman legionaries. No, they didn't fight like that. It was really still their own thing, and they were still heavy infantry in the process as such. So not... Some people said they didn't have shields, or at least they could... They, you also have to cope with the Roman legionaries that have scuta, right? And that, again, are could have not been simply adapted en masse by a liberal Phoenician warrior that had his own way of fighting already on his own and didn't need, say, just to copy a Roman legionary to, to be effective in his own way, right? And just it's not a one versus one thing. It's all about, say, um, tactics, arms, uh, synergy, and so all what Hannibal mastered at a level that goes far beyond the individual warrior, which is also relatively uh, in influence. Uh, in, in, in this scale of things uh, and it has again mostly to do with collective training that was also unusual right, uh, the, the liberal Phoenicians didn't definitely have uh, a particularly advanced way of war right, surely not more than uh, the Roman manipular legionnaire, right, it, it's about what an animal invested as uh, you know, a private oligarch in order to train these guys over and over and over and in order to do what they would do in Italy. But it's it's not a progress thing. It's actually not even a progress thing in Carthage herself, right? Again, there is this idea that the Carthaginians at some point reformed their army. We can properly set the timeline. Uh, they, they copied the, the, the Spartan way of war, wisdom, whatever. It's all BS. Like, literally, everybody knew how to do certain things. Just it took a lot of resources. And the reason why Hannibal did what it what it did was a bit like a miracle in in the kind of in ancient war. In fact, something that we remember as like like a, a, uh, an extraordinary achievement, to say the least. Um, and it depended on again that particular will, not on a progress standard pack way the Carthaginians would fight. There had been experiments. Hamilcar had already, for example. Uh, trying this kind of uh, capacity of willing parts of the army to catch the enemy uh, uh, from uh, on the flank, uh, unbeknownst to them, all these kind of things. 
So there had been a minimal experience in from actually in the very last decades before the, the Punic War, not not something older. Um, but again, it was also mostly a Barsid achievement, not really a Punic achievement overall, uh, or a liberal Phoenician one, or whatever, right? Um, so Carthaginian infantry would mostly fight in this closely packed uh, array, right? While the other arms were, in fact, as we've seen normally for, for the times and places, very much subordinate to the same heavy infantry, right? Um, we see also naturally different battle lines, as was the norm. Uh, a Carthaginian army in Sicily in 309 uh, BC fought in two separate phalanxes, one of um, actually of Hellenic mercenaries and one of so-called barbarians from the Hellenic historiography that no doubt in this sense have referred to the Libyans or Li the Libo Phoenicians that were something different from properly the, the Carthaginian, Punic, whatever, like people also properly from Phoenician descent, uh, etc. Now, the various lighter armed mercenary troops um, were a big deal in Carthaginian warfare. Um, however, it doesn't seem as, in fact, their nature would just uh, suggest regarded for particular importance, right? Again, light infantry is, or light cavalry are such exactly because they can't hold their ground against heavier types of, of troops. Um, so sources go on by describing them often as a crowd of rabble also followed along for the sake of booty, right? So we're not talking necessarily about, say, we we'll see now the Balearic slingers or other kind of experienced bodies of mercenaries that were also quite expansive in that regard. But generally, like all the scum of the earth that would normally follow an army at the time just for the sake of looting, and especially uh, considering the Carthaginian world, let's say at least the surrounding one, um, uh, were easy to find because essentially, if you look at, uh, you know, at, at Greece, at Italy, at the same some areas, especially the coastline, you, you have essentially civilized realities. But in the immediate interland, this is especially the case of North Africa. It's just like semi-desertic, you know, eventually desertic areas. There's not really a civilization out there. Carthage is a civilization because it's a Phoenician colony, right? Um, say today's Tunisia has a somehow fertile interland that allowed other cultures to, to, to in fact, to grab themselves in it. Uh, eventually the Romans would, the, the Vandals would, the Arabs would, etc. But the, um, generally speaking, the, 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 the Berber interland, as you know, was pretty wild. So it, it pr extremely primitive, right? These were some of the most underdeveloped areas of, of the world, also in terms of military development. These were the only ones, together with Northern Europe, where there was still uh, chariot warfare, right? Um, and actually, the Carthaginians, as we will see, used chariots themselves by the, the 4th century BC, when it was still kind of a thing, even in, in other areas, right? At least chariot warfare as a bit of a regular um, type of employment, because but we're talking about very late chariot warfare when chariots were pretty heavy, bulky, etc., and designed mostly to smash, uh, not to carry out the sophisticated um, combined arm tactics of the Bronze Age. So we'll, you know what I'm talking about if you have the basics of, of ancient warfare. But we will right, but we will uh, see this in other videos. There is a Bronze Age uh, warfare playlist that, as you know, I um, I. Uh, I feel every once in a while with new stuff. Um, so there is little sign in general of an attempt to take advantage of the different weapons and capabilities of the various nationalities before Annibalic times. Right, this is also important. There wasn't such a great awareness of willingness to exploit like the potential of this ethnic uh, fighting styles, m mostly because uh, at at the end of the day, the, 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 the most advanced, updated, powerful militaries out there were the, the aforementioned ones made up of essentially heavy, uh, you know, heavy troops from political organizations, mostly of statal type, of urban type, um, as 
proper kingdoms, statically speaking, um, uh, then this other forces that mostly came from tribal backgrounds that thus were actually subordinated to the more civilized ones and thus just provided with this relatively cheaper um, types of troops that were, you know, you know, dying for, again, much less simply because what they could earn in, in the service of this greater powers, aside from not being literally wiped out by them in case of revolt, was an enormous deal in their in their tribal homeland, right? And the reason, uh, the, the, the way this would be literally transferred on, on the battlefield uh, as in broader international politics is that they those were the weaker powers and they provided with the weaker units. They could be very good at, say, skirmishing um, uh, both on horseback, on foot, whatever, but a skirmisher, by definition, is, is a light troop and gives ground to, to the other. So it, they were useful and the Carthaginians naturally would use that to, to a good efficiency, but without actually... Uh, without much of a greater capacity of any other power, right? So we know of Hannibal, of course, but Hannibal is not just the entire Carthaginian history, right? So the thing is different. There, there were exceptions, as we were saying before. For example, the Balearic Slingers that were uh, also admiringly mentioned by the sources um, and that were kind of famous in general, like the Rhodians, um, etc. So this mostly... Um, uh, you know, Highlander uh, uh, shepherds that just had this poor lifestyle but were connected enough to be hired um, substantially by the this greater powers and just this link is a very shepherd w kind of weapon. Um, and we've seen this in, in various videos including the ones about the, the Roman auxiliaries because some, eventually all these troops would be, all these peoples would be conquered by Rome in the Western Mediterranean, so the, they, they eventually were employed in the Roman army uh, as well. Um, also, the idea that the Carthaginians had a, a good cavalry doesn't mean that Carthage was particularly successful, at least in cavalry mounted warfare, right? If you look, for example, at the Battle of Cremises, um, you see at least according to the sources, the, the Carthaginian uh, cavalry uh, defeated as a, as the consequence of a complete lack of cavalry scouts. I mean, think about the fact that the Romans were ambushed also at the same time the same, by the same Carthaginians at the Trasimene or at Carai or Teutoburg. Normally, yes, these things could happen, but they do not tell us much about a greater or kind of lesser quality of, of cavalry. Carthaginians had good cavalry, they were obsessed with horses, you see, um, at least their, their oligarchy, you see the horse appearing, in fact, in the, in, uh, just in Punic mythology, in, uh, Pun uh, in Carthaginian iconography, on the coins, etc., famously now. Um, the main deal being that they had good cavalry, but contained in number, but just like the, the citizen phalanx, etc., they, they were contained, they mostly relied numerically on the Numidians, as we will see now. This, as we will see, is a crucial point because um, those, uh, say, many doesn't necessarily mean, again, individually uh, strong, right? We often have this idea that, for example, I don't know, Celtic cavalry was strong. Mostly it's just that the Celts could field substantial amounts and they fought against peoples, including the Romans, that had less, generally speaking. But it doesn't mean that there were a better cavalry than the Roman ones, for example. The same goes here. Like, the the uh, the Romans, the Carthaginians, had historically actually very good cavalry, uh, but they preferred to use cheaper one because they could find it in even larger numbers and even reducing their own numbers in the process. It was naturally a political issue, right? You don't want to expose too much your own uh, nobility, you, you, if you want, you can rely on allies, think about the the Italic cavalry contingents were tribal, the Roman ones, normally. Um, but again, that has a cost and eventually settles politically and socially in ways that you see late, the late Republic and other uh, army, let's say the Marian army, uh, with the later 
uh, social war uh, settling the role of, of the italics uh, or the italians better considered that they weren't just italics uh, shows you that eventually the roman cavalry force in the legion so the citizen cavalry was quite small right almost non-existent right it, it, yet that doesn't mean that the romans wouldn't know how to have actually a very good cavalry traditionally themselves um, so a bit the same concept applies to the Carthaginians here right um, we see also some some interesting um, episodes for example at the battle of Tunis against the Syracusans in Africa by the way I made a video about that battle it's quite interesting you can find it again in, either in the uh, Carthaginian warfare Carthaginian history playlist or in the Atlantic one I think there is a playlist on Syracuse at this point uh, but there the the Carthaginians would uh, essentially employ their best cavalry uh, in a forlorn frontal attack on Hellenic hoplites which again was not how normally things were were conceived right nor in uh, in let's say at least in Atlantic warfare, it's possible that the Carthaginians were habituated to kind of softer infantry than the Atlantic phalanxes, because aside from Carthage herself, they, they wouldn't fight against many other heavier peoples, as we've seen. Mostly, they would have to to clash against the I don't know Numidian infantry, Maurian infantry that weren't really just nothing. They had their own heavy infantry as well, uh, occasionally. Aside from his general skirmishing, um, you know, um, attitude, uh, but it's possible here that uh, that we find one of the exceptions of properly isolated warfare as far as of, of one skin, right? The Greeks fought against many other Greek cities because they were all around. The Carthaginians were just a Phoenician city isolated from any other Carthaginian reality. At least you could have we have the the example of mercenary rebellions. But they're mercenaries, right? Um, yes, there are heavy infantrymen. We see the Barians, the the Celts, etc. Uh, and those are also kind of slightly later times. But it's possible that on the occasion of the Battle of Tunis, sending just cavalry against the Atlantic um, uh, Hoplitic line was just maybe an overconfidence. On the it's never, you know, they surely knew their deal there. It's just that they, they maybe were habituated to have their own cavalry taking on more aggressive roles against kind of weaker infantry in Africa. That's the idea I can uh, have in mind. And it's it's a relatively archaic time, right? So when, uh, generally speaking, uh, still even chariot warfare had been partly uh, in use up to recently... Um, in 309 BC, we find the Numidians found in their traditional skirmishing role already in the Carthaginian army. However, in the 4th century, as we were saying before, one of the most distinctive Carthaginian arms was the chariot. Right? Again, it was a bit outdated, a bit old fashioned, uh, but not quite, especially for these, um, um, again, peoples that, in fact, had a bit of weaker infantry. Again, the stronger infantry came usually from from Europe and or at least areas that had had an important um, um, a mix of political, ethnic, demographic compaction. Again, it's possible that in these less kind of civic realities, uh, at least as far as the masses are concerned, because the Carthaginian government, as we've seen, was very oligarchic, the the permanence, the greater permanence of the chariot is exactly a symbol of, of, of the weakness of the average infantry locally. Again, also within the same urban context. It's, it's a bit like the reason why, I don't know, the Etruscans used chariot warfare more than, say, the, the Latins or, or other italics, apparently. Um, it, the idea that there are... M- more brutal kind of Indo-European peoples in arms, like a bit you see the the, the sea peoples, then the, the Greeks, the, the the Italics, that traditionally are poor but more warlike, and so they have in their men the actually the world that would manage to stop cavalry. The the sea peoples objectively brought an end to 
chariot warfare, at least as far as the Iron Age was concerned, again, mostly also in the Syro Mesopotamian plains where the chariot remained for, for a longer time. Think about the Seleucids and so on. Um, it's because uh, you, you have, a again, a much bulkier chariot, like a, a real massive thing that you just launch at full speed. It's not meant to maneuver. It's not meant to... It's actually pretty encumbered and very often also an effective thing, at least, again, more... In fact, if, think about, I don't know, the Romans uh, against the Seleucids at battles like Magnesia, etc. The, the, these uh, kind of, um, at least in that case, the Adoki powers looked pretty good. It was a bit of a, a bit of a Hellenistic idea of um, technologism, right? You have elephants and, and, and uh, you know, and uh, catapults and, and chariots and all this weird stuff, but then Eventually, it's just a bunch of barbarians like the Romans that arrive, just as full infantry that that get the thing done uh, by by degree, or at least you know with some other lighter, simpler uh, support, like in that case, Pergamene cavalry that was, or that didn't, you know, the Pergamene didn't have uh, even as essentially successor states of Alexander. They were too small to have a phalanx, but they knew how to cope against uh, war chariots, especially against the Seleucids that had been making a substantial use of them just by skirmishing them like hitting the horses with uh, mounted skirmishers javeliners and uh, being skilled enough with much less cost to take them out to even make them rout against the uh, feared Seleucid cataphracts right, modeled from the Persian probably by Antiochus III during his Anabab, Persian Anabazes and that were not useful so again um as we were saying before, not even in Carthaginian armies, chariots were at this point seen just in the heroic sense. They had already kind of declined even in in North Africa and in the Phoenician world in favor instead of bulkier infantry. But they were still seen um, uh, deemed useful in certain cases. Uh, in fact, um, at the Battle of Cremises, you see the Carthaginian chariots effectively protecting their own infantry from the Hellenic cavalry's attempts to prevent them deploying. Right, so with the chariots driving up and down and protecting the front, and the enemy horsemen being compelled to wheel about continuously uh, as to prevent their own formation being broken up. Right, and especially think about seated chariots that could harm the horses, legs, and things, you know, chariots against cavalry normally are successful, so um, at least in in, um, in this context, uh, they they were dangerous, and the the chariots did, wouldn't do much in that sense, m- more than that, but they would still allow, um, like this, again, bulky, dangerous things um, that could smash you, um, in, uh, and uh, effectively prevent a, a unitary formation to just get through them. It would allow the heavy infantry, the most important arm, to deploy safely. Right. So it's a bit like the same function of skirmishers sometimes. And partly the the chariots had uh, skirmishers, archers, whatever in their crews. So it it was still important by this time. However, at the Battle of Tunis, as we've seen, the chariots too were wasted by the Carthaginians in a frontal attack on Hoplite. So the idea that they thought still they could break this heavier infantry from the northern shores of the Mediterranean were seen as viable by the Carthaginians, again failing. So I'm probably decreeing uh, the, actually the disappearance of chariots in the, in the following decades, right? So... Um, the um, the the only thing that we can see here is that not just infantry warfare was now pretty substantial, but that even cavalry warfare was surpassing um, for good um, uh, overall. Right, uh, chariot warfare again, chariots could hurt cavalry a lot, but there weren't so many, and so. Um, costs, um, uh, benefits, uh, um, you know, uh, convenient just to substitute cavalry at this point. So uh, given also the the pretty good Carthaginian cavalry was 
uh, there anyway um, they dropped of use without too many further problems again for whichever reason they were being used at the time what it was still a thing right it was still functional they weren't I never buy this idea that there were dumb peoples that vote in, in, in the way they did just because they were too stupid to to get the right one right all these peoples vote by wisely combining all their their forces and just testing each other with political and social changes that would affect the military just in ways that were unpredictable until you would see it on on the battlefield and still with very balanced odds right so never buy into technologism and the idea ah you know this weapon this arm whatever is the thing that made the change that's cringy right and we really do not need it um so the it, this mashing power however remained um uh, as it was partially substituted at least there's maybe not necessarily a connection but it developed in in, in parallel with the introduction of elephants famously enough so at the battle of Acragas during the first Punic War in 262 the uh, Carthaginians um, seemed uh, unsure how to best use this new arm because elephants are pretty complicated to, to manage at least you know they require specific um, you know uh, training they they must be led on the battlefield in a very precise order the just operating lines you have to to find the right time they're dangerous because if they begin to to freak out they can again smash into your own lines as would happen and so on um and uh the in fact uh the elephants at acragas were drawn up in the second line uh, and swept away when the first line of mercenaries broke um, so Xantippus at the Battle of Bagratus, so again this Spartan guy that had come to Carthage, like at least, um, and had actually found himself there, organized partially that the Carthaginian army against the Roman invasion during the first the first Punic War, that as you know could have ended it there, right? Instead, uh, you know the Carthaginians won and the war dragged on for rather for a very long time um, again uh, well Xanthippus used 100 elephants uh, in a straightforward charge to open the battle uh, which effectively succeeded in trampling down the Roman line right uh, the Romans had already met the elephants um, the Indian ones decades before and they had had trouble with that they preferred to confront the epirot phalanges that were definitely not you know uh, uh you know a child's play to to cope with than facing the the elephants they had ways to take them out anyway again the hellenistic arms wouldn't have too too much success at the end of the day um nor uh say the elephants in general but in this case at bagratus uh you could see what effectively the the right use um, of elephants could do, right? You sent this pretty heavy um, uh, animal running fundamentally to the enemy battle lines, smashing everything and uh, disordering them so that you could easily uh, eventually take them over. It's mostly about making them freak out. And there is a psychological component to it rather than even the, the actual physical impact, but that thing existed as well then you have to, to do specific things to knock out elephants because basically it's just sticking something in their butt is the only way of hurting them because otherwise their skin is so thick and all the rest of, of the body that um, unless you scare them in some way there, there's no way to, to take them down easily um, at um, Panormus in 250 however the Carthaginians learned the vulnerability of the elephants um, that were used uh, in fact to open the attack when again um, yep this became stand standard tactic a bit um, the same Hamilcar Barca used his elephants to charge down the rebel mercenaries in open battle Right, as well as to trample prisoners, right? 
uh, Hannibal at the Battle of the Trebia River initially used um, the elephants to disorder the Roman cavalry, whose horses were not used to the elephants, because the horses are nervous when they see them. Um, but when they were driven off by Roman light infantry, he managed to regroup them and reverted them to the traditional role, sending them basically to, into charge and break the Roman Gallic allies. Um, so that's also interesting because it shows how, how trained that the same uh, elephants and crews were, really were, to, because uh, it was pretty difficult to simply retrieve uh, an elephant from for and multiple ones for a charge and reordering them right so it was a big deal in just Hannibal's uh, uh, training standards and military genius could really achieve something like that so that's um, as you know the, the, the army that entered Italy was a very well calibrated one tactically speaking for the purposes that in fact Hannibal had in mind to carry out this masterpieces would convince the um, and the Italian allies to defect uh, from Rome. Um, famously enough, um, Hannibal used the elephants at the Battle of Zama, um, so in the final uh, battle of the Second Punic War, in actually in a disadvantageous situation for the Carthaginians, was like the like the, the most standard use, opening the battle with their charge against the enemy infantry. Right, uh, and the Roman velites skirmishers were mauled badly, but heavy infantry, famously enough, opened um, had been opened like uh, in the rear with some corridors, literally to make the elephant lines passing through. Right, because again, the elephant charge is carried out by you have a female in heat at the top, and then all the males following. That's literally the only way you can use elephants. On the battlefield, right to have a line to form, like that. That's the trick. Um, so the Romans didn't even need probably to take them out, or if even if they did, because they had surrounded them at that point, they neutralized them. However, it's worth mentioning that, and I made a video specifically about this. I mean, the uh, about the African war elephant. Uh, I, I made a videos from properly the from the Carthaginians to the. To the, to the Ptolemies, to, to the Romans, and uh, the latter, in fact, would keep using elephants from North Africa after they had essentially subdued uh, the region uh, during the, 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 uh, the Punic Wars, and these um, Numidian auxiliaries, because they mostly came from, from there, were employed famously enough at the Battle of Cynoscephali, for example, so in Greece, later even in um, against the Celtiberians in Spain, so actually, the Romans themselves used the elephants for a while, which which naturally shows how, generally speaking, effective they were, and or how again it, it's just another tool you have, um, and so investing that and or in a certain amount of uh, I don't know, foot soldiers would have been an equivalent. So it's not either ah bad or wrong, right? They they had them, they could use them, right? Um, another use of elephants um, was to force a way into an enemy camp. For example, Hanno did this against the rebel mercenaries uh, and Hannibal near Capua in 211. Which is also fascinating because elephants were trained to to actually uh, destroy fortifications, at least, you know, the, the enemy battlements kind of storm cleaning them, sweeping of, of the enemies um, and properly smashing to the, the structures was not perhaps the most ideal of use but let's say against lighter fortifications yes they, they could work like that um, now as we were saying before um, the Carthaginians began to use this um, tactic uh, which would become standard, that is, the double envelopment, um, at the Battle of Bagratus, uh, under Xantippus. Again, the idea is that you need sufficiently trained troops from a collective point of view, uh, a good uh, command, uh, 
you know good good uh, officers and COs you must have uh, again uh, repeated this in drills over and over again to be successful um, and it generally speaking shows at this point in the third century let's say the the the, the second half of the third century BC how you know had how, how advanced of course Carthaginian military culture uh, culture was to carry out these maneuvers were quite complicated because um, they entail differently even from the Macedonian war for properly the wheeling of entire parts of the battle line and uh, plus quite heterogeneous ones because as we've seen there were lots of mercenaries this was done with elephants as well to increase the the smashing power because major they arrive from from the rear it, it's the worst right just like with adding unit but you know with the extra uh, weight extra power of elephants um so the the idea especially during the um the Annibalic war is that the Carthaginians had superior cavalry that managed to chase off the Romano Italic one and then to fall on the flanks and rear of the infantry. Right? This was uh, a most famous tactic in at Cannae. Uh also at the Battle of the Trebia River, but as we will see, it's not much about a as I was saying before, a pregressed kind of quality near end to I don't know Carthaginian troops, or even less, given that uh, the mercenary ones, right? Um, the, the the tactic was established practice by the time Hannibal left Spain, because he had been training, like the, the Barset clan had already, as we've seen, uh, been, you know, uh, trying this. For example, Hasdrubal tried the same thing, uh, Ibera also uh, later. It's a bit like, again, Scipio's tactic as we would learn it from Hannibal but that was already in the air because Nero to use this um, at the Metaurus uh, again successful against the same Carthaginians um, so again this western Mediterranean was growing um, in the art of war and certain you know conclusions of that scale of warfare now and uh, had to just you know uh, be be collected right as mature uh, fruits we, we can't say what is interesting the most is what kind of men were employed to to carry out this uh, double envelopment because um, again the high degree of discipline and control that Hannibal had instilled into his cavalry is basically not present um, anywhere else. Basically, e even the same Romans, uh, the Romans would do this with cavalry, but mostly they they would carry out f famously with with uh, infantry. Think about the Battle of the Great Plains. We have seen the Battle of Ilipa as well. We have seen uh, well the, the Battle of Zama. It was pretty much the same thing. So Scipio had uh, learned quite well how to perform it itself. But what is really incredible and we will have to see it in in the in the videos about all this battle again about Ilipa you have it I re-uploaded it just um, last year with uh, new pictures better pictures um, the um, at, at Kanai that is the masterpiece the the enveloping cavalry of Hannibal was made up of Celts and Iberians and the thing is really surprising because the Celts and Iberians had, again, plenty of cavalry. They were actually fairly good at it, but they um, uh, they they weren't particularly trained, and even less collectively so, uh, horsemen. Right? That these cultures were pretty much tribal in nature, and as such, they they had a great individual capacity they carried out stunts on horseback and again we, I made recently a video about Iberian warfare we've seen how the Spaniards were even better than the Nubians right uh, so even though they were heavier this is a thing that is often overlooked that not necessarily being a guy that runs away again not only makes you superior but not even spares you from being reached by a heavier horseman would also uh, cut you to pieces in, in the process, especially with those beautiful um, Iberian blades. 
um, but again, collectively speaking, these cavalries were not really good, right? This is this is a concept that, especially as far as this sort of neo celtic philia that emerged on the internet, makes you believe that I, I don't know that the Celts had super cavalry, it was so strong, whatever. It's you know, it's actually um, um, a cognitive bias that you took actually from you know, ironically from Roman sources because. What what they really meant is that the Gauls, for example, had more cavalry than the Romans, and this uh, uh, doesn't mean that the that Celtic cavalry was better than the Roman one. Actually, as you will see, that the Romans had, qualitatively speaking, superior cavalry, and this is always neglected uh, because people don't even look at. Uh, strength ratios, numbers, whatever. And the Romans were just complaining about the fact that, you know, if the enemy was even a kind of a tribal power, but uh, they, they had more more cavalry, that cavalry was a problem. And so, generally speaking, they would regard as Celtic uh, horsemen as one, but not because these cavalrymen had a particularly efficient collective train. They didn't literally have the political and social structures to afford that. And this is the reason why, basically, they, did, they didn't carry out any particularly exceptional feat, except in Hannibal's employment. Not even in Carthaginian employment, broadly meant, but just under such a, a, a strapitos military leader like, like Hannibal. Right? So, this is a great testament, naturally, not just to the commander's ability, but to the same troops that were able to perform essentially the tribal charge at the Battle of Cannae, right? Famously enough, the Iberians and the Celts uh, at, uh, at Cannae broke first Roman cavalry, right? Then they wouldn't get out of hand and pursue, as it normally happened, uh, really with all cavalries, not just uh, the Numidians or whatever. But they actually had the discipline and control to swing across the Roman rear. They charged the Italian horse on the other flank. So second charge. Then they regrouped again, which is incredible, right? And delivered yet a third charge on the rear of the infantry. And this is utterly exceptional, right? In the, in, 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 in the mil, military annals, this thing cannot happen unless... Uh, un, uh, unless you are a, 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 a traumatically trained cavalry of the finest type, right? And again, we don't see this happening practically in any other circumstance. We just know this was done by the barons and the Celts exclusively at the Battle of Cannae, right? Not even in other battles in the same Hannibal's, uh, under same Hannibal's command, right? So Cannae was... As you know, the, the apex, again, of tactics, historically speaking. Um, so Hannibal had prepared it, and that's what properly an anabolic battle really is. Um, and had trained all the troops here. Uh, the same can be said also by, the, for example, the Gallic center, the, the, the kind of uh, gradual uh, attraction of the Romans in the center. Again, how... Those goals that notoriously were not disciplined uh, were able to perform that. Naturally, Hannibal had trained them, but he was also kind of he was also lucky because there is no military victory by anyone, even by the greatest military commander ever, without luck. It's a definition of the art of war, of what war technically is. But was also relying on some kind of individual kind of inclinations of these peoples, in a way. So trying to make the most of them, but at the same time conferring them a level, an adequate level of training, a collective training that could be able to make them perform that. Again, if you look at the Barians or the Celts in Central Europe, whatever, they like they didn't do this, right? Not not even other cavalries around, unless we're talking properly about the Macedonian feudal elite of the Attire or something like that. I mean, three charges do not happen. Right, this is what people often do not really get. Right, for example, at Zama, Hannibal didn't have any of this for the infantry, etc. They had pretty standard troops, the, the Carthaginian militias. He couldn't make much with that. He was just with his hands tied because 
just it was over practically he tried his best just because you know the romans had arrived at carthage and he just had to to do something about it but he he didn't have the the potential at that point he had had at Cannae or at Trasimene and that's actually what Scipio literally told him according to the sources just before the battle um, face to face but you just normally do not have units that do this let alone Iberians and, and Celts right so this is a huge deal right in a Again, military t- context, it was pretty much advanced. We've seen both the Romans and the Carthaginians had pretty good cavalry. They, generally speaking, relied on pretty good allied cavalry, such as the Italian and the Numidian one, respectively. But this was the making of a Hannibal. It was something else, right? And that was, again, one of the measures of, of this commander just per se. Um, also, the Numidians uh, naturally made uh, a considerable impression, right? Uh, they were, however, lighter troops. Normally, the Romans the, the Romans needed them because the problem was, like, it would be in Africa that they would manage to bring um, essentially enough Numidians uh, from their own size that... Uh, as we said before, normally when you attacked, uh, cavalry was fighting mostly on the wings, as you know, uh, especially at this point, um, by the late 3rd century BC, you, the, the point was crushing the enemy cavalry. And um, at that point, if they were heavies, and so if you break them, they, they can't um, regroup unless, in fact, normally this was the point, you would chase them, right? So what happened at Zama, famously enough, is that Hannibal counted on his Numidians just to give way and to prevent the uh, Roman cavalry um, to just be able to come back and attack the the Carthaginian army on, on, on the flank, on the rear. Right, so the idea was running away and let this cavalry chase them. Because the, how, this is how it was normally done, especially if you have skirmishers, right? If you do not actually reach them and cut them down, um, these um, can escape, but if, if you stop chasing them, they will come back and they're still essentially functional in their role. So Hannibal, as we said at Zama, was at least in that way desperately buying time for trying to win, to, to pull off like a victory with you know not very favorable odds but he failed anyway um and uh, in any case uh this troops could really be useful in many other um tactical um situation right uh and in the end again what we see happening under hannibal is absent tactically speaking from the carthaginian the, the previous Carthaginian military history. So again, this depended on him. That it didn't depend on a particularly, you know, uh, alchemically advanced uh, Punic uh, strategic culture that we don't see, or which mystery of doctrine, or whatever existed behind it. This this was just very good leadership, right? Very good, you know, uh, elements at least made so. Luck, right? Cook. The uh, determination, clarity of objectives. Again, such a, lo- uh, a great of a, of a military mind like Hannibal is really rare, right? Then you have a Scipio that rises and that really has something to say, and in fact carries out literally a perfect campaign, um, uh, really bringing the thing to the ultimate consequence. Um, And we'll have to talk about that too because it's really fantastic. But generally speaking, again, all this, right, the same Second Punic War happened because of Hannibal. Happened because the Romans, after the the victory in, in the First Punic War, had the upper hand. They were superior to the Carthaginians in manpower, in maritime force, in everything. So Carthage had just to sit there or and and die or do something desperate about it. Hannibal lost because at the end of the day 
the Romano-Italic Confederacy was coriaceous and not even the bloodbath of Cannae could shatter it. Actually, what happened after Cannae is that Hannibal was much more traumatically impacted by the fact that uh, Rome did not give up and that thus, you know, it was over because you could hope at that point again as it would uh, just to make the Roman much more paranoid, think about Aquintus uh, Fabius Maximus and the fact that he would have never properly won the war. They would have just pushed them out of Italy, but they would have not essentially taken the next step, which Scipio did, by bringing the war in, not just in Spain, but in Africa proper, um, for political reasons to internally to Rome that are famous enough, but I'm not going to, to digress this. Um, but, again, it was all a mean to an end. You have to understand how Hannibal's army was specifically designed to try the best tactically-wise, because that basically was the only, uh, say, dimension in which, um, uh, fr from which you could gain such a strategic advantage, like a sort of moral shock to Rome, hoping to shatter its confeder her confederacy, right? The thing failed anyway. So even the spectacular victories of the Carthaginians in Italy were not enough uh, to to break Rome. Um, so, uh, as we were seeing before, like all these lighter troops were pretty useful, especially during the Italian campaign. I mean, they would always be useful, but again, you're in enemy territory, in the heartland of the enemy. Uh, it's a unknown uh, terrain, largely. So, Numidian cavalry was invaluable as far as scouting was concerned, right? Uh, think about how Hannibal eluded the Romans, managed to to create the perfect ambush in military history, that is the Trasmand Lake. Um, so the, the, another very important thing was about raiding and foraging, because uh, Hannibal had very limited resources. It could not afford even just to stop too much in a single place, had to really to to gather as much as he could, pass him by and trying to eventually install himself in areas that were at least supporting him, like mostly in southern Italy where the Roman the you know, the locals didn't like the Romans so much. Um the only ones who broke fundamentally from from the alliance. Um so devastating enemy territory, uh, gathering in supplies, but this is the same thing that the Romans began to do against Hannibal. Uh, just think about uh, just after Cannae, Scipio not breaking after the 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 magnitudinal disaster would just morally impact from a radically traumatic point of view anyone. It was the first one who said, "We have just to attack them now. We have to wear them out now because they have their guard lowered. Let's go attack this granary, this other. Let's begin to wear them out." So really, there are a lot of clash of great minds. Um, among at least many others but for a bit less, but on average, uh, that's normal. Um, as we were saying before, it was thanks to the desertion of most of the Numidians that, uh, to Rome that Hannibal uh, was decisively uh, outnumbered in cavalry at Zama and could not try the, uh, the, the tactical envelopment, but had to fight essentially a straight frontal battle, refusing the wings, just hoping to, in fact, nullify with the time the enemy cavalry would stay away that uh, inferiority on the flanks. Um, so, regarding the double envelopment, um, th there was a danger, which was essentially that the enemy may cut their way through the center before the flanks closed their trap. This happened, famously enough, at the Battle of Trebia River, and at a great cost at Ibera, but this is the reason why, essentially, um, Hannibal, uh, you know, uh, employed his, um, the, the same tactic at Cannae, because essentially the Romans were counting on breaking through in the center once again, and this, this could, in fact, make them fall in the perfect trap, except what we don't recognizes that differently how people think but the Romans actually 
were right in using that array. Right? It was not a stupid idea. It was exactly what you had to do to break the enemy. Because at the end of the day, you can, if you break the center, uh, the wings can't do anything. So it's never like, oh my god, we got him. Right? No battle is certain right, uh, in, in its outcome until this, this has been um, reached. Right? So everything is a huge gamble. It's just one step away from disaster. Right, so the Romans could have used better tactics. We will talk about it. Like, for example, at Pharsalus, think about Caesar, right? Trapping cavalry, at least making the same cavalry, following a sort of ambush, etc. But again, the Roman formation at Cannae was pretty darn good, right? And it, it was not, again, the, the dumb idiots that fall in this big map. Because, a bit, let's be honest, there is a certain type of historiography that is a, a bit obsessed. Sort of in a sadistic way, in kind of a morbid way, it was about blood massacres. This kind of, uh, you know, armies of the great peoples that are suffered this devastating thing. Yeah, okay, but if, if you want to make a strategic analysis, you can't look at Kana and say, well, you know, the, the Romans were so dumb because, you know, Hannibal just out uh, smarted them because, the, you know, what we're doing was fundamentally wrong. No. Hannibal outsmarted them exactly because they were doing the right thing and still he managed to calculate something that by the right measure which is something very difficult to carry out but he managed to pull that off again uh, would would become the same right? I mean the more you invest in one thing and the more that thing can backfire because the more you invest in that and the more you gamble on it right? it, it's how high you bet on a single thing because if you win that, if you do that, you win everything. But if you lose, you lose everything at the same time. So actually, strategy is about this, right? When you, when you, when you lure the enemy in, in a trap like that, it's because they consistently have a very. I mean, the odds are dramatically balanced, and the anabolic battle is exactly this, right? You're bringing the enemy to fight uh, the way you basically planned, but still. In, in in the way they could fully commit their forces thinking that they have a good advantage because they do actually have a good advantage um, so it, it's it, it's it's the idea of properly a resolutive uh, like a say uh, here I should make many digression in terms of the theory of the art of war um, but the, the idea is again that this battle was uh, uh, an instrument to Cause such a bloodshed as it was to actually shock the the Roman Italic Confederacy into breaking down, the Allies separating from Rome. This failed, arguably, but again, if Hannibal had lost there, he would have lost everything. Just like in many other circumstances, it was the same reason why he objectively could not um, besiege Rome and people quote marble without understanding the fact that he was wrong, right, in criticizing Hannibal for not having besieged Rome, because obviously, from a strategic point of view, it didn't make any sense to besiege Rome after Cannae uh, and more. But again, people do not analyze literally, like map in hand, forces on the ground, sources, whatever, to just leave by hearsay and say, you know, and even properly misinterpret the depth of classical sources by uh, not understanding what was said there was actually not used to blame Hannibal, whatever, for 21st century people to think that they were smarter than a Carthaginian general of the 3rd century, and especially this one, but just to actually reflect on the stupidity of people who do not see strategy, which is exactly what, you know, in the sense, whoever complains in that regard really, really is, right? So you don't teach Hannibal how to fight. That, that's dumb, right? You know, you can't criticize him in certain things, but at the same time, a gamble is a gamble, and you can't fight. You have to to evaluate still on a historical basis on whatever you wish. Um, so, um, at Cannae, so specifically talking about the risk of the center collapsing, this was a huge deal. If, if the Gallic center uh, at Cannae had collapsed, Hannibal would have lost. Right. At the same time, he had to use troops that would be, in a sense, expandable. Um, and that could, in fact, you know, receive the Roman legionnaires uh, l 
for 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 a specific time it would wear them out in, in part it would nat naturally test the resistance so to give time to the trap as we've seen the cavalry acting this uh, three consecutive charges successfully on the flanks and so on for this reason the goals were not just enough so um uh, the again, what, what the girls did was remarkable, considering that they didn't have much of a discipline or a collective training, but they managed to follow the plan to gradually withdraw. In part, this would just happen, uh, uh, just with the consequence of the, uh, by the consequence of the Roman push. But Hannibal was aware of this, um, this risk, and he stiffened the goals with alternate units of his veteran Iberians, right? Because he thought that alone just the Celts couldn't quite make them uh, in that context. Uh, and this was successful, by the way. So you, what, what the other interesting thing you see here is that how this different peoples were, just their different, different military cultures were successfully combined, even though they didn't have much of any glue. Actually, the sources describing uh, the Second Punic War stress, well, also in other contexts, how also heterogeneous um, peoples like the Celts and the Barians were. The fact that they didn't really have standard units, uh, they they were, again, somehow uh, difficult to to discipline, all this stuff. So, again, understanding here, just you can't simply re- create them from scratch, right? There was something about the Celtic or Iberian nature that Hannibal used profitably in these tactical roles. And at the same time, enough he managed to bend them to higher standards um, to reach that good enough that would make the magic on the battle. And at Canaan, this magic happened, right? Um, um, so... In fact, this is how the the thing really worked because Hannibal at Cannae didn't simply refuse his center, right? This would have, in part, yes, you would think it would have initially uh, brought the Romans forward into the trap, but it would have also initially given less time properly for the Carthaginians to, to envelop the, the Romans as well, right? So... It had to be perfectly calibrated because if the thing, again, didn't time um, uh, right, right, if this movement had not been synchronized, the battle would have been lost, right? So actually, he did, he thought well to exploit um, the Celts and the Barians' um, uh, assault, right, aggressiveness by initially throwing them forward in the center and just gradually after that so after having gained part of the ground right even just not necessarily against the romans but even just physically on on the battlefield they would retreat slowly right across the same length right so this would hold up the roman advance while the flanks closed in the timing, again, how he, he made it, again, you, you should have asked really only him, because this was, again, the, probably the greatest tactical masterpieces in the entire history of mankind. Um, but he he made it with these men, with these warriors. Um, uh, this is the point, right? Uh, you, you must tribute Han, uh, to Hannibal's leadership the notoriously fickle and short-winded goals actually standing up to this prolonged punishment. Because um, we've seen also in the videos about Celtic warfare that the uh, um, the goals mostly relied on the initial impetus, but in, then when this, uh, you know, if this didn't had was not enough to break through, normally they broke, right? They could retreat somewhere else, another position to, to a last stand. But generally speaking, the Celts were famous for this, right? They they placed everything in the charge, but then they wouldn't hold much, right? The Germans were different, for example. They, they were a bit more politically cohesive, military effective. They they also withdrew orderly with a battle line. If, if they didn't break naturally uh, before, right? They they slowly 
gradually treated. The Celts were just trying... The reason being the fact that the Celtic world was already going towards a sort of, you know, uh, essentially uh, oligarchic, uh, if not quasi-feudal direction, with the bulk of the warriors actually becoming ever more dependent and you know, on the great landlords and disarmed and whatever, so that either they had just very good mercenary units at some point, but the bulk of the infantry would, generally speaking, not be able, again, to withstand more than um, that single charge at the beginning. So again, the, the barons were a bit similar, even though they they were also famous, as we've seen, for kind of retreating, at least coming back multiple times um, after breaking. Uh, but still, in, in practice, especially in a single day of battle in those hours, um, it was a big deal also for them to hold the ground as well. But as we've seen, especially the barons were veterans altogether, at least there were some units that were stationed among the Gauls themselves that came from a bit more of experienced um, uh, veteran background. Um, Importantly enough, also the Libyan veterans were refused on the flanks, because naturally there was this pretty sturdy Libo-Phoenician infantry that was a bit the protagonist as well of Hannibal's army in Italy, like in, in the good uh, Carthaginian tradition, as we've seen. Um, so they had essentially to uh, to to withdraw, uh, withdraw on the flanks, then to, have, to advance later and attack the Roman flanks, right, enveloping as well. So as you know, the Romans were basically encircled because they had the cavalry attacking them from the rear. The, um, the, 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 the African wings that, as we've seen, were also, in this sense, better trained than the Gauls and the Iberians, right? The Libo Phoenician, in order to carry out this tactic, were probably the good African veteran infantry, right? And this is mostly uh, what the, some of these men would, uh, last uh, would would stand uh, to the last uh, at the battle of of Zana, right, where they were butchered by the Romans when when circled them, uh, together with some also uh, Italian troops that had defected Rome that had followed Hannibal to that point. But at Zama, this had remained a few, right? Hannibal didn't have all those good troops uh, anymore; they had been worn out, numerically speaking, and so he couldn't do with the the numbers that just the Carthaginian militia offered uh, because this was not trained enough, right? Uh, those same maneuvers, right? This is what I wanted to say before, that a Carthaginian militia could have never done what the libo Phoenician veterans did at Cannae on the wings because those were veterans. They were much better trained. They were fighting for from years. Um, and that's the... The, the difference that uh, military experience and, and, and collective training really does, right? Hannibal uh, could rely on them because of that. And, and those African uh, infantrymen on the wings were, by the way, the ones on which he relied the most, even more uh, than the, the Celts and the Barons in the center. Because those were, in the center, were also more expandable. The African veterans weren't. Right, and they had to carry out this much more complex tactics, right, of enveloping the enemy on the flanks. Um, so again, Kanai is a masterpiece that you cannot properly compare to anything else that has ever been done humanly um, on a battlefield, um, and um, you just see how crucial these elements were. For the rest, uh, the Libo Phoenicians were normally, as infantry, were stationed in the center. Right. This was also, again, normally, aside from Kanai, again, that, that is really something on its own, that the normal uh, deployment, as we've seen, consisted in the normal heavy infantry battle line, the center. Th that's it. There would be multiple ones, depending on what kind of effect you wanted to, to achieve, like at Zama, right, that where the, the, enemy, the Carthaginian army was deployed in, in consistent depth because they had to essentially tire down the Romans uh, unsuccessful because again they, they could at best buy time but in terms of hand-to-hand -hand combat in order also uh, collective training at that point the Scipio's legionaries were superior to them um, 
so it's the concept of reserve of gradual effort uh, etc um, in all this what, what about lighter troops uh, like javelin men slingers uh, were um, well let's say in in Italy they were used actually to great effect um, uh, with much greater risk uh, much more aggressively than before in Carthaginian military history because naturally the army had to be bold had to open again again famously enough Hannibal said if, uh, we either have to find a way of or create one right to, to bypass the, the Roman army again in in their own homeland right and so he succeeded right so we're talking about really not just Hannibal's of course uh, genius but the actual expertise of these troops in finding uh, terrain scouting skirmishing screening whatever so to to allow this army to literally even disappear from the Roman raiders and popping up again uh, somewhere that they didn't think was possible to uh, they were crucial but the uh, if not the unsung heroes of the situation but still very very and properly vital troops um, without which in fact even the heavy infantry could have ever been deployed in tactically advantageous situations because they would have simply not had had the right ground to do so if they if um, the lighter troops had not properly found uh, it uh, you know in time um, so their tactics were pretty pretty classical right for light infantry we're talking again screening deployment supporting cavalry uh, joining in the envelopment of the flanks and rear that's an important thing right lighter troops normally during these battles skirmished and retreated in the gaps uh, between the various units that always existed um because just they were in open order so they didn't they were not a mass they were just scattered and they could pass through even this narrow paths that had nothing to do with what the enemy would exploit because you know either a section of the line collapses and then you can't pass through say the enemy array but normally the, the gaps between the units were never historically exploited ever in military history ever right L not don't come up with the bullshit of pitna that's a completely different thing right here we're talking properly about the that where a phalanx had been broken so not the obvious minimal space existed even probably a large one be a larger one between the various units you you don't enter with another unit there there's no tactical advantage for that you have either to pass completely to enter the array and wheeling about and falling on the enemy rank which was also something that doesn't happen normally right and in order to do that the, the enemy line must be properly be broken not the, the natural separation existing in every single army between a, a, a unit and another. Um, so um, Hannibal would use um, the lighter troops as also for holding hills um, in ambushes. Um, again, as we were saying before, after the skirmish, they retreated behind the the ranks of heavy infantry. They would just stay behind them because mostly they were not meant even to in, to join in hand to hand combat because they were tired but psychologically seeing there are other people behind even if you can't see how armed they are even if you know that they're lighter troops because normally just the heavier the he even within heavy infantry the best troops are in the front ranks usually um and and you know that behind there are le lesser troops but generally speaking that there is a noise a mass that you can push with infantry and so on plus really at the end of the battle when you have broken heavy infantry psycho psychophysically you uh, you can't simply send lighter cavalry or infantry to just catch these guys without you know, they just uh, run faster even if they are exhausted themselves than the heavies even if they throw their armor etc but it's really after the battle you 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 find this kind of trauma from which some people simply died. I mean, it happens that people would be so mentally shocked that they died on the spot. Um, it's completely normal, right? This can't happen. It happened in all battles, and it, we uh, do not have 
normally fortunately the palest idea of the extent of this when you know there is probably a such a heavy shock like the one you could think at Kana and so on um, so again there were other heavy troops like the Spanish Scutari they were pretty good uh, we talked about them in the video about Iberian warfare so essentially the heavy inf infantry of in, in of Iberian armies um, that already fought like any of the especially tribal infantries in very close connection with the lighter troops even sometimes in a sort of part of you would all sense like you know the guys being sort of squires of the heavies and so on um, so Hannibal's light troops uh, at least in the early stages of the second Punic War seemed also superior uh, to the Roman light infantry eventually uh, Scipio really uh, turned the Velitas into something else like in Spain especially they they adopted the in fact this the the Gladius Hispaniensis made a video about that which exalted the light infantry aggressiveness so these Velitas became not just like throw away lighter troops um, normally in other countries um, these uh, troops were either serfs or something in the Roman army they were actual Roman citizens but they were still of the poorest and uh, more throwing away instead in Spain that of course had a lot of guerrilla there was a lot of their political diplomatic play of Scipio to win the support of the Celtiberians against the Carthaginians famously enough um, the 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 Velitas equipped with again this this impressive local swords and sent as kind of on difficult terrain etc as aggressive light infantry really turned um uh turned the tides in in many on, on many occasions right and this 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 aspect is somehow underappreciated so that by the end of the war really the Romans had properly better and properly Roman infantry than, than the Carthaginian one uh, this is fan and naturally they had the italic ones but at, at, at this point we know that the Romans and the italics looked identical uh, we know exactly by the second Punic War that um, there was no way to distinguish them anymore because also well they were the same people technically but they they were now fully one right and open really to a as we were saying before a season of roman all-round warfare professionalism of you know foreign uh overseas occupation uh etc so really a professional army of the finest kind uh, so surpassing actually the carthaginian one what had been left of, of it right of the Nibalic one the Carthage had not supported adequately Hannibal's reason of jealousies and so on in any case really Rome had matured like was already more powerful than Carthage after the first Punic War and now was just you know stepping further in the in the ultimate um, in fact level of you know of, of imperial domination and Rome takes over as the incredible basically the single most important thing that ever happened in the history of mankind in absolute terms by any standard exactly from this war onwards and shifting the, essentially the tide Rome and her Apollonian virile uh, heavenly uh, dominion basically swept the Mediterranean and reversed right the trend of decline towards the Dionysian ketonic um, demonic feminine forces that Carthage embodied and destroyed them and opened to naturally to the Empire and the golden era and the salvation of mankind that ever since you know the universal Empire at that point have been affirmed like and since to this very day so um, this is um, you know it's a big deal Right, the entire history of Scipio's, um, you know, meditations on 
the temple of uh, Jupiter, uh, the temple of Mens, the, this, this kind of ascetic preparation is all one to the standards of work needed for uh, military superiority that would practically not be reachieved in in relative terms uh, to the to the circumstances ever in the history of mankind. This is literally the peak of human warfare. Uh, let's say of human capacity in warfare and uh, not even this, the Roman army of the 2nd century BC would really be up to Scipio's standards even though it was naturally evolving towards uh, still some permanent professional directions and everything would be functionalized but let's say what was achieved in those early days was nothing was something much more difficult than later so that's why it was superior in relative terms because nobody had thought even that humans could have could have, could really achieve that right so with Hannibal and Scipio we have again uh, you, you you even can't picture mentally that these people actually existed and this is something that I think you should wake up every day literally thinking which is mind-blowing to say the least um, just like for Alexander for that matter but here we are at the immediately and uh, just lower level but by few right so we are uh, really amazed uh, and privileged to have this history to draw from and to realize that we actually exist in the wake of the Roman victory and achieved through this military history in this specific passage right from the Carthaginian achievements to the Roman redemption and and, and victory so it's something that goes beyond it, it's metaphysical but um, it passes through analyzing these military cultures right so again my plan as far as the Carthaginian army is concerned to is to so we, we have made the army organization video now the tactics then we will have to pass to the various units and to the various battles all right so this will take much longer time because it just happened so I already did something but there is much more to do especially as far as the second Punic War is concerned and we will definitely we'll, I, I will have to create a series at some point because again it's literally the most important war in the history of mankind it must be studied like you, you must know it by heart in the first place um, so um, for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content I thank you as always heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye